I think that's how far. I think that only goes to just how far the within the last two years, really, the whole idea of selling an image has gone. Now, like Duran, Duran are going out of their way. Well, we're not, but it, it's happened, whether we like it or not, that we're avoiding to oversell ourselves. Um, I mean, you know, there's there's that song, "Video Killed the Radio Star," and it's becoming true. The cliche about the 1960s is that if you remember the time, you weren't really there. The 1980s were different, though. You can't help but remember them, even if you weren't there, because it seems as if every second of the decade was captured on high-resolution videotape. It was an era of images, from the triumphant grin of Margaret Thatcher to the Chinese students confronting the tanks in Tiananmen Square. Yuppies, space shuttles, Madonna, Maradona, and perhaps the defining look: five young men with black eyeliner and knife-sharp cheekbones. They were, they are, Duran Duran, and for a few years in the 80s, they were simultaneously the most adored and the most reviled performers in the world of pop. They worshipped David Bowie and Roxy Music, and rode the new romantic bandwagon until the chrome wheels melted. They said they wanted to be a mixture of Chic and the Sex Pistols, and ended up working with members of both seminal bands. Most remarkably, they survived a downturn in their fortunes when the posters started to come down from teenage girls' walls, and returned in their definitive lineup to massive acclaim in 2004, nearly a quarter of a century after they'd formed. From futurist new romantics via funky experimentalism to elder statesmen of pop. For the new millennium, how did this happen? How did they stay together when their contemporaries spanned our ballet, culture club, visage, human league, a flock of seagulls, kajagoogoo, either imploded or ended up on tacky nostalgia tours? To answer that, we have to go to an unlikely place. Welcome to Birmingham. It's our home game, really, isn't it? It's、um, different. We, we, we got an MTV award earlier this year, and we got a Q award.、Um, but the Brits is just a bit. It's, it's, it's a little bit more glamorous than、um, actually for me. Either of those, yeah. I, I think, think it's great to get recognition in Britain as well because we've all, we've always had、uh, respect in the US, and、um, we were successful in the eighties here, but we never really had critical acclaim or acclaim from the industry. Birmingham in the West Midlands is the second biggest city in the United Kingdom, but its influence on British pop music has been well behind that of smaller towns such as Manchester, Liverpool, and Bristol. Before the late 1970s, probably the biggest act to come out of the city was The Move, a psychedelic pop group that hit number one in 1969 with Blackberry Way, and in turn spawned Wizard and the Electric Light Orchestra. Birmingham was better known for the motorway nexus known as Spaghetti Junction and the notoriously cheap soap opera Crossroads. Of course, just because there were no great musicians who called Birmingham their home, didn't mean that there were no music fans. During the 1970s, just like their contemporaries across the country, Birmingham's teenagers gazed open-mouthed at the likes of David Bowie, Roxy Music, and T-Rex on top of the pops. They honed their disco moves to the music of Chic and Earth, Wind, and Fire, and they felt the thrill of rebellion by playing the punk hits of the Sex Pistols and the Clash. In this respect, Nigel John Taylor and Nicholas James Bates were typical Brummy teens. Nigel was born in 1960. Nick, two years later, they met in 1971 when they were introduced by a mutual friend. Their musical interests were similar. The first gig they attended was by Bowie's guitarist Mick Ronson, shortly followed by Roxy Music, the art pop band fronted by Brian Ferry. Nigel went quickly from being a passive fan to having his own dreams of stardom, and then he started learning guitar. In 1977, he began playing with his first real band, Shock Treatment. At around this time, both lads left school. 
The economic situation, especially in the old industrial centres like Birmingham, was bleak and youth unemployment was mounting. Nigel got a place at art college, but his main focus wasn't on painting or sculpture. Like Brian Ferry, John Lennon, Freddie Mercury and so many others, art school was to be a breeding ground for dreams of rock stardom. At college, he made the acquaintance of a fellow student called Stephen Duffy. In turn, the new arrival was introduced to Nick Bates and the three of them decided to form a band. Stephen, who had already written several songs, was to sing and play bass. Nigel was becoming increasingly adept on the guitar. And Nick took advantage of the latest developments in musical technology, stabbing his way around an electronic keyboard. He was also responsible for minding the fourth member of the band, a drum machine. The only thing they were lacking was a name. All three were fans of Roger Vadim's 1968 science fiction movie Barbarella, starring Jane Fonda. They weren't the only ones, as the movie had given its name to one of Birmingham's cooler night spots. Discussing the camp fantasy one day, one of the trio mentioned the villainous character Duran Duran, played in the movie by the Irish actor Milo O'Shea. Dropping the hyphen, they had a name. And not only a name, they also had a gig or two booked. Duran Duran's first performance took place on April 5, 1978, in a hall at Birmingham Polytechnic. With a total attendance of less than a dozen people, it was hardly an auspicious start. But it was a start. The band began getting regular gigs at smaller venues around Birmingham. They also expanded to become a quartet with Simon Colley playing bass and occasional clarinet. The city was picking up on changes in the musical landscape as sounds and styles from London and New York began to permeate its grim functional facade. The most important development came at the end of 1978, when the Rum Runner Club opened, borrowing its style from the notorious New York discotheque Studio 54. The members of Duran Duran were regulars there, picking up on the mix of black funk and icy synthesizer sounds. In April of 1979, Stephen Duffy and Simon Colley left the band, but a singer called Andy Wickett soon arrived to take over the microphone. Shortly afterwards, deciding that the drum machine was limiting their live sound, they poached the drummer from a punk band called The Scent Organs. His name was Roger Taylor. Born in April 1960, he'd been drumming since he was 14. Andy Wickett left shortly afterwards and Roger persuaded the former singer of The Scent Organs, Jeff Thomas, to replace him. Jeff never performed live with Duran Duran, but he did sing on a number of demo tapes that the band hawked around various record companies, with little success. The changes in personnel also brought about a gradual change in style. Nigel Taylor, who was now using his middle name, John, became strongly influenced by the New York disco funk band Chic, especially their bass guitarist Bernard Edwards. He switched to bass and the band took on a new lead guitarist, Alan Curtis. His stint with the group only lasted a few weeks and to replace him, the band placed an ad in the weekly magazine Melody Maker. The successful applicant was yet another Taylor, Andy this time. Born near Newcastle in 1961, he started gigging with cover bands at the age of 13. In 1977, he joined the punk band Motorway and released a single called Teenage Girls, which went nowhere. By this stage, Duran Duran had lost another singer, Jeff Thomas, having formed a new band with Alan Curtis. But things weren't all bad. The Barrow Brothers, proprietors of the Rum Runner, let the band use the club as a rehearsal space and gave the members odd jobs as DJs, bouncers and bar staff. But without a regular frontman, Duran Duran's future seemed grim. Then, in May 1980, a drama student at Birmingham University heard that the band needed a vocalist. He turned up to audition in pink leopard skin trousers, a suitably ostentatious entrance for Mr. Simon Le Bon.
Well, we made all our mistakes in front of the whole world. I mean, everybody else just does it in front of their mates, don't they? But uh, That's true. No, there's a few good ones. There's a few good ones in there. Simon James Le Bon was born in Watford, near London, in 1958. His musical talents became obvious early on when he sang with the local church choir. He also appeared in a number of TV commercials and had a role in a West End show, a musical version of Tom Brown's School Days. He later worked as a hospital porter, spent a term at art school, stayed on an Israeli kibbutz for a few months and sang with several punk-influenced bands. Enrolling to study drama at Birmingham was yet another attempt to find some kind of creative outlet. Simon's arrival also filled an important gap within Duran Duran. He had been writing lyrics and poems for several years, and many of these seemed to fit with the instrumentals created by his new bandmates. Suddenly, the band was recharged. With the Barrows officially on board as their managers, Duran Duran started progressing in a more professional direction. They recorded their first single, Planet Earth, and planned to release it on their own Tritech label. The Barrows also got them a support slot on the UK tour of Hazel O'Connor, star of the bleak futurist rock movie Breaking Glass. The band had already shown its gift for publicity seeking after John Taylor read an article in Sounds about the London band Spandau Ballet. The journalist had described them as new romantics and Taylor immediately called the paper to announce that Duran Duran formed the Midlands chapter of this new breed and should be getting the same sort of attention. Betty Page's interview with the band provided their first nationwide media coverage. As if to reinforce their credentials, they slipped a reference to the new youth cult into the lyrics of Planet Earth at the last minute. I'm a new romantic looking for the TV sound, proclaimed Simon. This ability to lock into the spirit of the times, plus their success on the Hazel O'Connor tour, provoked a bidding war with London record companies, and Duran Duran quickly found themselves on the books of the mighty EMI label. The Tritech version of Planet Earth was scrapped and they re-recorded it for a full national release that reached number 12 in early 1981. Within 10 months, they'd gone from being a stumbling, singerless bunch of amateurs to performing on top of the pops. Almost accidentally, Duran Duran found themselves in the right place at the right time. Their music had the futuristic feel of bands like Ultravox and Visage, but it was mixed with pop hooks and funky dance-based rhythms. This is the music you'll be dancing to when the bomb drops, they said, fusing the twin 80s obsession of selfish pleasure and nuclear annihilation. Equally important, they looked fantastic, a factor that would be crucial when they tried to make it big in North America. Simon, with his lush lips, was clearly the main visual focus as the lead singer, but each fan had their favourite. John's tall, brooding masculinity with cheekbones to die for, the androgynous beauty of Nick, who by now had taken the surname Rhodes, Andy's cheeky, hyperactive humour, Roger's quiet, shy sensitivity. As with teen sensations like the Beatles and the Bay City Rollers, there was something for everyone. In the summer of 1981, EMI released the band's debut self-titled album, which eventually peaked at number three in the British charts. The strongest track was Girls on Film, which was their first single to break the top ten. It was aided by a seriously sexy video directed by Kevin Godley and Lol Krem, featuring several underclothed models. The LP had something for everyone. The hit singles were on side one, and the more grown-up experimental pieces influenced by post-punk bands like the Psychedelic Furs dominated side two. The band's fame was spreading beyond Britain, and in 1981 saw them make their first two visits to North America. It was around this time that they met the artist Andy Warhol, who was transfixed by their glossy beauty. And it wasn't just sexual. The man who had created seminal images of Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley and Mao Zedong saw their potential to be 20th century icons of the same magnitude. And they were about to get even bigger.
let me tell you how we wrote it. Nick and I got into a taxi and to go to the studio, and something came on the radio. And you know how you hear songs, and, you, and, and sometimes you don't really quite hear them quite right. And about 20 minutes later, I was walking to the studio, I was kind of humming this tune. And I knew it wasn't what I'd been listening to in the taxi. And I had this line, that's right, I had this line in my songbook, Hungry Like the Wolf. I had two of them, Hungry Like the Wolf and Union of the Snake. And I chose Hungry Like the Wolf and used that for it. 1982 was the year when Duran Duran matched the ambition of their evil namesake from Barbarella and conquered the known universe. Their songwriting had hit a commercial and creative peak, but that wasn't the whole story. The key to their success lies with another definitive invention of the 1980s, MTV. New Romanticism, if it ever had a philosophy, was about transcending the mundanities of everyday life. The music had to be futuristic with oblique lyrics and ethereal voices. But this wasn't enough. Romantics had to look defiantly other, with dyed, asymmetrically cut hair, thick makeup, frills and flounces compulsory for both sexes. It was really an extension of the outrageous haircuts and costumes that punk brought in its wake. But while punk couture had been consciously slapdash, the new romantics took hours to get this look precisely right. Duran Duran took this obsession with visual detail beyond their wardrobes and pioneered the glossy and expensive, yet essentially meaningless videos that filled the schedules for the new station MTV. Early music videos, such as Queen's groundbreaking Bohemian Rhapsody, were usually shot in the studio. Later, performers such as David Bowie and Adam Ant persuaded their record companies to fund location shots. Duran Duran trumped this by travelling to the most exotic locations conceivable, gallivanting in the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean, presenting luxurious scenarios of gorgeous women and pristine yachts. The boys were transformed into jet-setting lounge lizards or Indiana Jones clones. It was silly and self-indulgent, but it was hugely successful. The direction of Russell Mulcahy, later to achieve recognition as director of the cult Highlander movies, was a crucial ingredient in the success of many of the videos. This exoticism provided a perfect complement to the music of their second album, Rio, released in May 1982. Songs such as the wistful Save a Prayer and the aggressive Hungry Like the Wolf were pure teen pop confections, but they had just enough ambiguity in the lyrics and weirdness in the arrangements to appeal to older listeners. The chauffeur verged on the avant-garde, and Hold Back the Rain dipped its toe into New York's expanding club culture well before anybody was discussing the rock dance crossover. Nick Rhodes' contribution was crucial here, adding odd sound effects wherever he could, an obsession that would become more intense as his career progressed. Duran Mania was spreading across the globe, and the band undertook large-scale tours in Japan and Australia. However, if they really wanted to say they'd arrived, it was essential to crack America fully. Although MTV was crucial in raising their profile in the States, there was still a purist rock and roll ethic in the country, believing that successful bands had to prove themselves by cutting it on the live stage. June and July saw an extensive tour of the States and Canada, followed by a prestigious opening slot on the final Bad Tempered Tour by seminal new wavers Blondie. The autumn saw the band playing concerts in Europe, then it was back to New York for their biggest gig yet, an MTV-sponsored New Year ball at the Palladium. Gradually, the combination of relentless touring and intensive MTV rotation paid off, as Hungry Like the Wolf became their first single to broach the Billboard Top 10. Duran Duran had the world at their immaculately shod feet. Why did this all happening so quick? I mean, that thing with the sleeves rolled up. I did that. John came up with that yeah. because he, he couldn't play his bass with the, yeah. the tight suit on, so he decided to roll his sleeves up so he could play the bass. After
After the exertions of the previous year, at the beginning of 1983, the band members relaxed a little. Nick Rhodes concentrated on his new protégés, a pop quintet called Kajagoogoo, fronted by the barefoot bleach blonde singer Le Mal. Kajagoogoo seemed to have a similar mission to Duran Duran, in that they fused chart-friendly pop with more challenging music, in their case, jazz rock. With Nick handling production, their debut single, Too Shy, topped the UK charts in February, a feat that Duran Duran had not yet achieved. But the Kajagoogoo bubble would soon burst, Limal left the band and they only managed another two excursions into the top ten. In March, Duran Duran released their eighth single, Is There Something I Should Know? Simon's complaint that his lover is about as easy as a nuclear war came in for some ridicule, but the fans weren't listening. The record entered the British charts at number one, an extremely rare occurrence at the time. It also made the American top five. Work then began on the band's third album. Jetting between the south of France, the Caribbean and Australia, Duran Duran were almost becoming parodies of high-living rock stars. Champagne, cocaine and endless beautiful models were part of the lifestyle, although much of this was kept away from the eyes and ears of the band's devoted younger fans. Possibly the ultimate extravagance was when the band flew in a rare Bengal tiger to use for the album cover shoot. The single, Union of the Snake, was released as a preview of the forthcoming LP in October 1983. The album itself, the bizarrely titled Seven and the Ragged Tiger, came out the following month. It was a more conventional effort than its two predecessors, toning down Nick Rhodes' taste for sonic experimentation in favour of John Taylor's fondness for funky pop. As such, the critical response was lukewarm, but the fans were heedless. It topped the British album charts and made the top ten in the United States. By this stage, the band had begun their world tour with eight concerts in Australia. The Sing Blue Silver tour wended its way across the planet, taking in five nights at London's Wembley Arena, before progressing to Japan and North America. In February 1984, Duran Duran were in Pennsylvania when they discovered that they had won two Grammys. However, it wasn't their musical abilities that were being saluted. Both awards were for recent videos. It seemed as if, despite all their efforts, they might ultimately be remembered as pretty boys, posers and pin-ups, rather than as skilled musicians. They didn't have time to muse about this, however, as the North American tour carried on until the middle of April. At this stage, they were accompanied by a film crew committing their performances to celluloid for a proposed movie. The end of the Sing Blue Silver tour took some of the pressure off the band, but there was still work to be done. Studio filming for the movie project continued throughout the summer. In May, the single The Reflex followed Is There Something I Should Know to top the UK charts and repeated the trick in America, the band's first transatlantic number one. The record was produced by Niall Rogers, leader of Chic, the disco band that John Taylor claimed as half the inspiration for Duran Duran's sound. Taylor's association with the Chic machine would become even more important over the next year. On a more relaxed note, the band took part in a special edition of the British TV show Pop Quiz, hosted by Mike Reed. It was a clash of the new romantic titans and they faced their London rival Spandau Ballet. Duran won, although the fact that Spandau's career began to decline pretty soon afterwards might just have been an unfortunate coincidence. The twin figureheads of futuristic posing also came together in November 1984, when they were among the dozens who became Band-Aid to record Do They Know It's Christmas. The single, organised by Bob Geldof and Midge Ewer to raise funds and awareness for famine victims in Ethiopia, featured lead vocals by Simon Le Bon and Spandau's Tony Hadley, alongside Boy George, Bono of U2, Sting and many others. Duran Duran, on their own, were still masters of all they surveyed. The live album Arena further annoyed the critics with its studio fakery, 
but the fans dutifully took it into the top 10 on both sides of the Atlantic. The single Wild Boys, with its tribal war chant of a chorus, reached number two in both countries, accompanied by a Mad Max-style video that featured the original Duran Duran from Barbarella, Milo O'Shea. The clip included a sequence where Simon, strapped to the sail of a windmill, is ducked underwater. The windmill malfunctioned and the singer nearly drowned. This would not be the last time that he narrowly escaped a watery death. In May 1985, Duran Duran released their theme song for the James Bond movie A View to a Kill. It became their second chart topper in America and made number two in Britain, as well as being the best-selling Bond theme ever. But the band weren't around much to promote the song. Duran Duran were on holiday. I met them at uh, Fred Siegel in um, in, in uh, Santa Monica and I was walking in there and I had a pair of sunglasses on and this guy walked past me he went, hey, wait a minute, man, aren't you? I went, I looked at him and I thought it's Brad Pitt. I said, yeah, aren't you? He went, oh, man, you've got to wait till i got to tell my girlfriend. Hey, dude, hey, dude, come over here. And so Jennifer comes over and we start talking to her. She says, oh, you know, I used to, used to wait outside your hotel um, when, when I was a teenager. I said, that's great. And I should have said, well, if, you, if you're still interested, I'm saying at the peninsula down there. Yeah. <laughs> one of those things I thought of about five minutes later, you know. With Duran's success came a lot of money and the freedom to spend it how they wanted. Simon had become a keen yachtsman. Nick, once he'd got Kajagoogoo out of his system, developed a sideline as a photographer. He, Andy and Roger, were all married by now. And Simon was beginning a relationship with model Yasmin that would lead to marriage. For a while, it seemed as if John Taylor's main extracurricular activities consisted of partying, dating gorgeous women and crashing cars. While this fitted in with the band's extravagant lifestyle, it seemed something of a waste for a man who'd been the founder of the band. But it was John's high-profile social life that led to his next musical project. He was dating the model B.B. Buell and wanted to launch her on a musical career. Buell was a legendary rock and roll hanger-on. She'd gone out with Elvis Costello and Todd Rundgren, and her relationship with Aerosmith's Steve Tyler produced the actress Liv Tyler. She didn't have the world's strongest voice, but love is blind, or in this case, deaf. John suggested that she should record a version of the T-Rex classic Get It On, known in America as Bang A Gong. He recruited Andy to play guitar and Tony Thompson from his hero Chic to be the drummer. Bernard Edwards, also of Chic, produced. The demo never saw the light of day and John and BB split up shortly afterwards. However, by this stage, the members of the two bands had realised how much they enjoyed working together. They conceived the idea of a project called Big Brother, in which numerous singers and musicians would record with the core trio. Billy Idol and members of the Psychedelic Furs were among the performers who came along to jam, and it was a big thrill for John when he found himself playing alongside Mick Ronson, David Bowie's legendary guitarist. Among the singers invited to take part was Robert Palmer. The Yorkshire-born vocalist had developed a solid career as a sophisticated rock soul performer and was also a respected songwriter. After he'd recorded vocals for Get It On and the new track Communication, the others immediately scrapped the idea of having a varied roster of singers. Palmer was to be their frontman and the band would be known as the Power Station after the studio in which they were recording. Rather than follow the pattern of laid-back studio hopping to which Duran Duran had become accustomed, the power station recorded their debut album, 33 and a Third, in Manhattan in a matter of weeks. However, by the time their first single, Some Like It Hot, hit the charts, Robert Palmer had already pulled out of the project. Although sales were healthy, without the chance to promote the new band with live performances, the success of 33 and a Third was limited by comparison with Duran Duran. 
The power station recruited the American rock singer Michael DeBarre, whose previous band, Checkered Past, had supported Duran Duran in early 1984. The following year, Robert Palmer would go on to have the biggest success of his career, when Addicted to Love topped the US chart. It was promoted with a video that featured five leggy, gorgeous models. Very Duran. The power station fronted by de Barres toured in North America during the summer of 1985. They also played a short set at JFK Stadium, Philadelphia, as part of the massive Live Aid extravaganza. A few hours later, John and Andy rejoined their Duran Duran colleagues for a four-song set. It would be the last time that the classic quintet of Simon, Nick, John, Andy and Roger would play together for nearly two decades. While John and Andy were merging funk and rock with the power station, their bandmates hadn't put their feet up. Nick and Simon had been recording some new songs together, and Roger joined in the sessions. This developed into another side project, to be known as Arcadia. The resulting album, So Red the Rose, was unsurprisingly rather like Duran Duran, without the funky bass lines or occasional guitar solos. Nick's taste for odd keyboard effects, which had been edged out in the last couple of Duran Duran albums, came back to the fore, as well as borrowings from avant-garde classical and industrial music. A single from the album Election Day reached number seven in the UK charts in the autumn of 1985. But, as with the power station, the music didn't seem to have the immediate commercial appeal of Duran Duran. However, this lack of success had been put into perspective in August when Simon had another, more serious brush with disaster. At the beginning of the year, he'd bought a high-tech yacht named Drum and pulled together a crew which had proposed to enter some major races. He had enjoyed sailing since his teens, but this was serious, dangerous stuff. Off the coast of Cornwall while preparing for the fastnet race, the boat capsized. Simon and his crewmates were trapped under the hull for nearly half an hour until they were rescued by sailors from the Royal Navy. It was a narrow escape, but it didn't deter Simon from announcing that he'd be taking part in the even more arduous Whitbread Round the World race in a few months' time. Although the accident didn't do any lasting damage, it did reinforce the idea that the members of Duran Duran had more money than they knew what to do with. Side projects and hobbies were all very well, but what the fans really wanted was another Duran Duran album. This, however, would prove to be rather more difficult than anyone imagined. Having been to that, that video bonanza in Saint Tropez, it, it started it suddenly started to occur to me, you know, what you know, what video is doing for music and what bands are doing for video producers and directors, often cutting their own throats, I think. And I just think that music is a very important thing and to me more important than actually making videos. The problem arises when you get that line, you know, I walk out and the door slams and the door slams on the video. You've got problems. The plan was to reconvene sometime in the first half of 1986 to record Duran Duran's fourth studio album. But the various band members seemed to be enjoying the freedom from recording and promoting Duran Duran. Simon's relationship with Yasmin was developing quickly and the couple married at the end of 1985. He also took part on the repaired drum in the Whitbread Round the World race, although he was only on board the yacht for a few sections of the journey, making many media appearances, then rejoining the yacht at various locations. Andy was also enjoying a change of scenery. The more conventionally rock-orientated power station had brought his guitar-playing skills out into the open, and he enjoyed hanging out in the rock bars of Los Angeles. It was there that he made the acquaintance of Steve Jones, lead guitarist of the Sex Pistols, and the two decided to work together on what would be Andy's debut as a solo artist. John's quip about Sheik and the Pistols seemed to exert some kind of spell over the band members. Andy maintained, however, that his first loyalty was to Duran Duran. 
So did Roger, but it was clear that the introverted drummer was finding the constant media attention difficult to cope with. Finally, in December 1985, he announced that he was leaving the music business altogether and retiring to the countryside with his wife Giovanna. A proposed double-header concert with Culture Club in California was cancelled and it was down to the remaining foursome to plan the next direction for the band. The original members, John and Nick, regrouped in April 1986 to pool ideas for the new album. Simon was on his boat somewhere off the coast of South America, but was due to join them later. Andy, however, was nowhere to be seen. The next few months descended into a series of farcical situations, during which John, Nick and eventually Simon went from pleading with Andy to leave behind his rock and roll lifestyle in LA, to threatening him with legal action if he didn't restart work with Duran Duran. They had some sympathy with Roger's plight. Always the most diffident member of the quintet, the pressures of fame had pushed him to the brink of a nervous breakdown. Andy had no such excuse. He simply enjoyed his new LA lifestyle too much to come back to London. He also saw himself as a proper rock and roll guitarist in the image of his new buddy Steve Jones. Associations with the poppier sounds of Duran Duran were something of an embarrassment. But he was still under contract to his old band. With bad grace, he rejoined them in London to play on four songs, then disappeared again. Fortunately, the sessions were being produced by Niall Rogers, the guitarist for Chic, who filled in on a couple of tracks. By this stage, the band had recruited a new drummer, Steve Ferrone, who was no stranger to bands going through tricky times. He joined the Scottish soul-funk combo The Average White Band when their previous drummer had died after snorting heroin that he thought was cocaine. Then, having realised that Andy really wasn't coming back, they called in Warren Cocorillo, formerly of the Los Angeles band Missing Persons, to replace him. Missing Persons were another of the media-savvy new wave bands that sprang up in the early 80s thanks to MTV. But the links with Duran Duran didn't end there. The band's final album had been produced by Bernard Edwards of The Power Station and Chic. Also, when Andy Taylor formed his own band in LA, he used the missing persons rhythm section of Terry Bozio on drums and bassist Patrick O'Hearn alongside the guitar of Steve Jones. Warren and Steve were content to be salaried sidemen. For now, Duran Duran was a trio consisting of Simon, John and Nick. Once all the upheavals were finished, they could concentrate on the music. With Niall Rogers at the controls, the likelihood was that Notorious, the new Duran Duran album, would be a pretty funky affair. The focus was on John Taylor's bass and the introduction of a horn section added to the soulful feel. But the band's knack for writing immediate, catchy, radio-friendly hits seemed to be ebbing away. The title track was a good slab of danceable R&B and skin trade had elements of Prince's Paisley Park sound. But the band were no longer the darlings of the pop media, and the album failed to make the top ten on either side of the Atlantic. A world tour in the summer of 1987 proved that the fans were still loyal, and Duran Duran had the chance to work with two of their heroes. For a few nights, they became part of David Bowie's Glass Spider tour as it made its way across Canada. And the final concert featured a guest appearance by Lou Reed. Simon duetted with the former Velvet Underground frontman on two of his 1970s classics, Sweet Jane and Walk on the Wild Side. This would not be the last time the band tried their hand at his music. The critics, who had never taken the band particularly seriously, began to sharpen their knives. The defection of Andy and Roger was the beginning of the end, they said. As the 1980s progressed, young record buyers were deserting the MTV-friendly sheen of the new romantics in favour of hip-hop and house music. By the time of their next album, released in 1988, the band was giving the impression that they were a bunch of slightly trendy uncles trying desperately to catch up. Big Thing, an unfortunate title if ever there was one, showed that the band had been listening intently to the new sounds of techno and acid house, and Nick's taste for electronic trickery resurfaced. But they still weren't playing to their strengths, and there was no evidence of solid, accessible songwriting. 
MTV and mainstream radio were beginning to desert the band, and the album only squeezed into the British top 10. In the States, it didn't even reach the top 40. Worse was to come. In 1989, the band released a greatest hits compilation called Decade in an effort to remind the fans of their past glories. But in Britain, young music lovers were shambling to the baggy beats of Manchester bands such as the Stone Roses and Happy Mondays. Across the Atlantic, they were gearing up for a musical explosion from their own northwest that would be called Grunge. Duran's meticulously crafted pop hooks simply weren't on the agenda, and real men weren't wearing eyeliner anymore. The album reached number five in the British charts, but stalled in the mid-60s in the States. At the same time, the band released a new single, Burning the Ground, that included samples of several of their old hits. Considered now, it's a witty post-modern joke, but nobody got it in 1989. It reached number 31 in Britain and disappeared entirely in America. Their next studio album, 1990's Liberty, reflected the band's despondency and lack of direction. It took elements of funk from Notorious and made half-hearted attempts to go back to the stadium futurism of Seven and the Ragged Tiger. But these didn't coalesce to create a decent, coherent album. And sales were still disappointing by comparison with Duran Duran's glory days. The degree to which their star had waned is best summed up by the story of the burglary at the office in London. Apparently, the thief couldn't be bothered to steal any of their gold discs. Tired and glum, the band took another extended holiday. Well, actually, I was talking to Yasmin about this um, just yesterday, actually, and, and we sort of was, because we stayed together for nearly 18 years wow. now. We got to be mad for 18. We've, right. we've had our 18th anniversary. And I think one of the things that's, that, that kind of has kept us together is the periods apart, because you go away and you come back missing somebody, and, you, and you're happy to be back with them again. The very early 1990s were something of a limbo for the members of Duran Duran. They occasionally met up to write songs or for charity concerts, but otherwise spent most of their time apart. In 1991, John married the actress and presenter Amanda de Cadenet, so becoming the last in the classic lineup to get hitched. However, the following year, Nick was divorced from his wife Julianne. All three band members had their own projects on the boil. John worked on a solo project calling in help from his old rival, Spandau Ballet's Gary Kemp. Nick oversaw an album of Kajagoogoo remixes. And Simon's desire for speed got the better of him once again when he crashed in a motorcycle race in Wales. Reports that he was suffering from severe bruising to the groin only added to the merriment of cynics who saw him as an overgrown school kid who could afford life-size boys' toys. Gradually, by early 1992, they realised they had enough fresh material to consider putting a new album together. Apart from die-hard Duran fans, however, a few outsiders expressed much interest, until somebody from the band's American record label, Capitol, leaked a copy of one track to a radio station in Florida. It was clearly the work of Duran Duran, with full, lush synthesizers and Simon's intense voice, but there was something different about this song. The bombast and strutting of their early work had been replaced by an air of melancholy and thoughtfulness. I will learn to survive, sang Simon, contemplating the song's fictional breakup scenario. It was, of course, the public's first taste of ordinary world, and something in it struck a chord. By now, the members of Duran Duran were into their late 30s, facing the realities of divorce and disappointment. Their original fans were also no longer squealing teens, and the song spoke to them in a way that the band hadn't quite managed since the mid-1980s. Suddenly, it seemed that people cared again what Duran Duran were up to. Ordinary World was a top 10 single on both sides of the Atlantic, the first time the band had managed that feat since Notorious, seven years before. But did the single's success herald a new, mature sound for Duran Duran, or was it just a false dawn? 
The album, released at the end of February 1993, was titled simply Duran Duran. However, because the cover design featured wedding photographs of the band members' parents, Nick began referring to it as the wedding album. This unofficial usage spread to the wider world, mainly to distinguish the album from the band's self-titled debut. The LP also made the top 10 in the UK and US, and the critics too were pleasantly surprised by the quality and consistency of the songs, especially after the incoherent genre hopping of Liberty. Considered over a decade later, the only tracks that don't really work are the opener, the pop grunge Too Much Information, and a strained cover of the Velvet Underground's Femme Fatale. Buoyed up by the change in their commercial and critical fortunes, the band struck out on their world tour with a newfound confidence. Not only did they wow the crowds in Europe and North America, but they also broached new territories playing in South Africa and the United Arab Emirates. Unfortunately, Simon's vocal cords could not take the strain, and after a gig in the Netherlands in early September, several dates were cancelled or postponed. But this unfortunate setback wasn't enough to damage Duran Duran's regained credibility and popularity. What happened next, however, tried the patience of many of their most loyal fans. Ignoring the raised eyebrows that had accompanied their version of Femme Fatale, they decided to record an album entirely consisting of covers of their favourite songs. Still sticking to John's credo that their roots were as much in soul and funk as in alternative pop and rock, about half the songs chosen were originally by black artists. While Simon's take on Perfect Day was much better than the last Lou Reed song he'd attempted and The Doors' Crystal Ship was unnatural for his voice, some of the other choices simply didn't work. It probably wasn't a good idea to attempt the likes of Ball of Confusion, originally recorded by The Temptations in their psychedelic soul period. Or, most bizarrely, 9-11 is a joke by the intensely political rap outfit Public Enemy. To be fair to the singer, he expressed his discomfort at singing these songs and had to be conjoled into it by John and Warren. One of the few positive aspects of the Thank You project was the presence of the returning Roger Taylor, who played drums on a handful of tracks. The fans' nostalgic yearning for a reunion of the classic quintet lineup would soon be dashed, however. John Taylor was in a bad way. He was unable to shake off his drug problems and his marriage to Amanda de Cadenet was crumbling. He took part in a reunion of the power station with Robert Palmer, Andy Taylor and the Chic team, but walked out just before the album Living in Fear was completed. Bernard Edwards redid his bass parts. At a loose end in Los Angeles, John socialised with Andy's old sparring partner Steve Jones and also with Duff McKagan and Matt Sorum of Guns N' Roses. The idea to form some kind of punk metal supergroup began as something of a self-indulgent joke. But the Neurotic Outsiders project suddenly took on a life of its own. In 1996, the supergroup played a full-scale tour of North America and Europe. And at the beginning of the following year, John announced that he was no longer part of Duran Duran. The band had coped with defections before, but John was a founder member of the group. The remaining members didn't let the news destroy them, however, and Warren Cuccarillo, by now a full-time member, doubled on bass for the forthcoming album. What Simon, Nick and Warren really needed was a return to chart success, but it now seemed as if the wedding album had been a last gasp. The band's next two albums definitely had their moments. Electric Barbarella on 1997's Medazaland was a nod to the club culture and the movie that had spawned their identity. And playing with Uranium, a high spot of pop trash three years later, fused images of nuclear apocalypse with love lyrics in a way that the band hadn't managed since Is There Something I Should Know? But the public wasn't biting, and EMI dropped the band after an association of nearly two decades. To add to the gloom, their old friend Bernard Edwards had died in 1996. Robert Palmer and Tony Thompson would also pass away in the next few years. The success of the Duran Duran phenomenon had been down to a difficult combination of two elements. They constantly came up with new, original and creative sounds, styles and songs, but they also managed to give the public what they wanted. 
Maybe it was time to concentrate on the second half of the equation just a little bit more. We, we had a great tour with Robbie over there. It was, it was a lot of fun to do it. I mean, I, it's not for us to say who was better. You know, he had a very different show to us. He had a big production, big stage, dancers, lights and things. We just went on there and played rock and roll songs, you know. Mm. It was, uh, it was great, Robbie, actually. I think it's a great That's, evening. Um, it was a great learning experience for us. Yeah. Because people tend to think that we played huge venues back in the day. But really, our biggest audience on a general level was 10 to 20,000. Oh, yeah. And to go and play to 50,000 every night was something, you know, we had to learn how yeah, to do that. And Robbie's so good at doing that. As well as being talented musicians, the members of Duran Duran were aware of the business realities of life. While they were keen to present themselves as a contemporary relevant band, they knew that the casual CD buyer knew them best for strutting around on yachts and looking moody in deserts to the accompaniment of a defiantly 80s strand of synth rock. And they weren't averse to trading on those associations. Sometimes this was done in a subtle way, as with tracks like Burning the Ground and Electric Barbarella, which nodded to their past glories. The incestuous nature of their social circle also kept throwing up reminders of their past lives, as well as the regular mingling of members of Duran Duran, Chic, The Sex Pistols and Missing Persons, Warren Cucurillo had worked with Nick Beggs, bass player with Nick's old protégés Kanchagugu. Meanwhile, Nick himself began to work with a friend from the days before the band even had a record deal. After a chance encounter at a fashion show in Italy, he and Stephen Duffy formed a side project called The Devils. Sometimes the band's willingness to go down the nostalgia route went even further. In 1993, they had played a New Year party in Los Angeles, alongside fellow 80s throwback Adam Ant and the 1970s disco oddities Village People. And they spent the eve of the new millennium performing at a millionaire's private party in Atlanta, Georgia, in the unlikely company of grizzled blues rock veteran Joe Cocker and pop reggae warhorses in a circle. But they had not yet sunk to the level of the likes of the Human League, forced to tour medium-sized venues, playing 20-minute pre-selected greatest hit sets as part of a nostalgia tour, alongside the lightweight likes of Kim Wilde and Belinda Carlisle. But the end of their contract with EMI, and with Capital in the States, was a danger sign. To keep going in their current form needed a constant flow of cash. A deal with the Hollywood label foundered after the disappointing performance of the Pop Trash album. There was only one solution. The idea of reforming the quintet lineup that played on the first four Duran Duran albums was not new. There were meetings between various current and former members throughout the 1990s, but there always seemed to be obstacles to a reunion, whether it was a question of money, logistics, or plain and simple clashing egos. The three Taylors were still keeping busy in the music business. Andy was a guitarist and producer for hire, having worked with bands such as Thunder, Love and Money and then Jericho. John was now fronting the bizarrely named John Taylor Terroristen, and even Roger had followed up his brief appearances on Thank You with a studio dance project. But like the 21st century incarnation of Duran Duran, None of these projects was particularly successful when compared to the days of Rio or Seven and the Ragged Tiger. After the release of Pop Trash in 2000, rumours began to circulate about a reunion. This sort of gossip was always toughest on Warren Cucurillo. His loyalty to Duran Duran was complete. Although he kept himself busy with side projects, he never, unlike John Taylor, allowed them to get in the way of his work with the band. Moreover, by 2001, he'd been part of the Duran Duran setup for 15 years, longer than Andy and Roger Taylor's stints combined. However, it was a question of commercial reality. Warren was not part of the classic lineup that had adorned the walls of teenage girls in the early 1980s, therefore, he was dispensable. In consolation, immediately after leaving Duran Duran, he rejoined his old band Missing Persons for a similar reunion project. 
The anticipation of a Duran Duran revival grew over the coming months. Finally, it was confirmed. Simon Le Bon, Nick Rhodes, John Taylor, Andy Taylor and Roger Taylor would begin a tour of Asia, North America and Australasia in Japan in July 2003. The concerts were a sensation, with the band belting out the hits to a mixture of the original fans and kids who hadn't been born when Planet Earth first hit the shops. When they made a hero's return to London, tickets were changing hands outside the venue for £150 each, and when Simon yelled, you're about as easy as a nuclear war, it was almost as if they'd never been away. I'm going to go forward in the world, actually. Even though I wasn't in the band when this was written and recorded. I think that's right. It's quite important, actually. You know, there's quite a lot of songs that, that, that we that have been written over the course of our career. And, um, and we weren't always the five of us together. But the fact is, we go on stage now and we make these songs our own. They all belong to us now. From a perspective of over 20 years, some of the hysteria that surrounded Duran Duran's early career looks slightly comic. The line about people dancing to their music when the bomb drops sounds pretty dated, as nuclear paranoia has given way to fears of different environmental and political terrors. And let's be honest, some of the clothes, hair and makeup were a tad questionable, guys. But Duran Duran seemed to spearhead the last true expression of glamour in the music business. Successive musical genres from rave and baggy via grunge to Britpop and beyond reinforced the idea that the musician was just an ordinary Joe, that the fans could identify with him or her, that they could get up on the stage just as easily. The charm of Nirvana or Oasis is that they look as if they've just stepped off the street. Of course, there have been exceptions, such as the terrifying countenance that is Marilyn Manson. But Duran Duran seemed to belong to an age of innocence before so-called celebrity culture infected our perception of our heroes. The fans almost believed in the scenarios of the videos that the band members were heroes in the true sense of the word. So the band's reunion might be seen as some kind of wish fulfilment for a generation wanting to relive their glamorous childhood fantasies. But that doesn't explain why the reformed Duran Duran could play their hits to packed stadia across half the globe, while their chart rivals from the early 80s have to content themselves with singing to backing tracks in provincial concert halls. Maybe it's that underneath all the hairspray and lip gloss, this chance combination of five young men produced the chemistry that makes for magical pop music. It's not something you can set out to construct. It's either there or it's not. Sure, some of the lyrics were a little pretentious, and as for the cover versions, well, no thank you very much. But it's difficult not to find yourself singing along and shuffling in rhythm when girls on film or hungry like the wolf appear on a radio near you. It was this gift that led to the band receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award from Q magazine in 2003. And at the Brits, the prize-giving ceremony of the British music business the following year, they were recognised for their outstanding contribution to the industry. Critics who dismissed them as commercial, fluffy, teeny-bop fodder when they first came into view were now lauding their ironic twist. Duran Duran accepted the awards and the praise in an appropriate manner. The views of whoever decided to drop them from EMI are not recorded. Duran Duran's aim all those years ago was to merge the music of Chic and the Sex Pistols. They may never have fully succeeded or matched the historical importance of either of the bands, but they've had a lot of fun trying, and it was fun shared by millions around the world. And what's almost as important, they still look pretty good. Thank you for buying Maximum Duran Duran. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch out for further titles on Chrome Dreams coming up soon. 
If you did enjoy or have any comments or suggestions, write to us at Chrome Dreams, PO Box 230, New Malden, Surrey, UK, KT36YY, or email on mail at chromedreams.co.uk. Details of our full catalogue are listed on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. Thanks again for listening and goodbye for now.